Well, good evening. Uh, and uh, we might still get started at 8 o'clock because the first part is an introduction. And uh, Chris has a lot to cover. Uh, just want to remind everybody this is an interactive session. So we're going to encourage you to interact with each other and to interact with Chris. Uh, tonight's topic is I know a student with a problem just like that. And judging from the questions, uh, this looks like an area with a lot of interest. So let me um, quick just go through EdChat Interactive. Uh, we've put these together to allow you to experience uh, professional development online in a way that's more conducive to learning than the typical webinar. Uh, as we all know, it, uh, as adults, we learn best by interacting with each other, with reflecting, with participating. As a matter of fact, my guess is kids learn best that way also. And so we try to model that during the session. And because that, in order to model that, uh, we're using a platform called Shindig, uh, which is a little bit different from anything that you've probably used before. So I do want to introduce you to Shindig. And also let you know the next two sessions on uh, next Thursday, uh, we have another FETC uh, speaker, uh, speakers, Mia Laudato and Robin Williams, who are going to be talking about data is not a four-letter word, <laughs> um, how to use data and not curse. Uh, and in September, September 27th, uh, we're having Matt Harris talk about digital literacy for teachers. Um, and what, is that, what exactly does that mean? Uh, because uh, does it mean that you, you know how to do things, that you uh, are aware of things, uh, that you're aware of what your students are doing? And we're going to talk about what that, what that really means. Uh, both are doing sessions similar to that at FETC. So let me just go a little bit um, and describe the Shindig platform. And while we're at it, let me temporarily make this larger so you can see it. This should resemble what you were seeing on your screen before and, and kind of now. Uh, there's uh, There are multiple stages on screen. There's the slides and there's the person. And then you see floating around on the screen avatars of different people. And you see your own avatar with a menu next to your own avatar. All the way on the left is something called text chat. Uh, to the right of that is ask questions. That allows you to ask me a question, and then I can pass the question on to Chris. Or if it's a technical question, I can I can answer it. And then there's a uh, there's an icon for raising hand. There's going to be times where we say uh, we'd like a volunteer to come up and talk about how you're applying this, or Chris will ask you a question and ask if somebody will come up on stage. And if you're willing to come up on stage, you're going to click on the raise hand button and then we'll bring you up on stage and you can have a conversation with Chris and talk about whatever issues you want to bring up. So the text chat, um, I'd like to encourage you to click on that avatar now and let me uh, shrink this back and just show you. Uh, when you click on that avatar, you get a list of, you know, first of all, all the people here. And then on the right side, uh, you get a uh, text chat. Why don't you introduce yourself in the text chat now? So make sure that text chat is open. Um, and where are you from? And uh, why are you here? You know, what are you what are you looking to learn? Uh, what would you like to discuss? Now, as I mentioned before on on, on other EdChat interactives, the one person who can't see what you're typing is me. So I'm hoping that you type. Chris can type also, and he can um, respond to questions that you have and uh, and items that you that you type in. So that's really you know those are. Let me go back to that previous slide. So those those are three different ways of interacting. Okay, text chat is one way. Asking questions is another way. Raising your hand, which means you want my attention, and maybe you want to come up on stage, is the third way. And then there's a fourth way of interacting. Um, let me see. Uh, the fourth way of interacting is you can click on the avatar of another person to have a private video chat with that person. And I know that you know Chris has a lot of information he wants to go through. So sometimes we go through and we, and we practice that. But rather than practicing that now, um, I think uh, we'll, we'll, we may be using that during the course of the session. So uh, 
you know, here's an example of what it's going to look like when you're chatting with some with somebody, and what you you know when you're ready to disconnect with that person. Let me just explain and this is a second so you can see it a little bit better um, there's a way to disconnect from that person um, so that you can again listen to to Chris or whoever's talking up on stage so those are the four different ways of interacting and now let me let me bring Chris up and I'd like to introduce you to Chris Bougay uh, who's coming to us from Virginia and who's being featured at FETC. So Chris, why don't you, you know, maybe just uh, introduce yourself. Like, are you a Mets fan or like, or what? No, <laughs> no I grew up in Buffalo, surprisingly enough. So I'm a uh, Buffalo Bills fan. <laughs> ah, right, okay. All right. Which is p painful. Um, but uh, right now I live in the Northern Virginia area. So um, I work for Loudoun County Public Schools. Not that I'm here representing them at all, but that's where I, I that's where my, my day job. And my background mm -hmm. is actually I'm a, a speech language pathologist, if you can believe it. Uh, so, what does a speech language pathologist do? Uh, they're like the speech therapist in a school, you know, uh -huh. people with help uh, people with speech and language disorders. Um, wow! So, I would imagine most educators work with speech therapists or have speech therapists in their schools, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so, I started as a speech therapist 20 years ago. This year is my 20th year in education, but about 15 years ago, uh, I was asked to start. Uh, be one of the members of the assistive technology team. 15 years ago, assistive technology was really new. People didn't really understand what it was and how it works, and I, we still are facing that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, our administration was wise enough to say, yeah, we can't handle this. We don't know what it is, so we're going to put a team in place to handle it, and you just run everything mm -hmm. past us. And I've been working in that capacity ever since. So um, everything that we're going to talk about today and that we discussed today it's all going to be about inclusion and accessibility and thinking of things from a perspective of how do we get everybody involved, not just uh, uh, not just students with disabilities, not just students without disabilities, but inclusive altogether. And I know there are a lot of questions on motivation, and that's going to be a key thing that you talk about tonight also, I understand. So yeah. I'm going to get out of your way, okay, and uh, let you go. I'm going, to ex I'm going to bring myself down. I'm going to expand your slides and just let me know uh, how, else, how I can help. All right. Well, thanks everybody for being here um, and for you know participating in this. You should know that I am going to lean heavily on all of you for the interactive components. Yeah. Uh, when we were talking about putting this session together, it was all about how to make it interactive. So I think it's going to be very, uh, uh, it's going to be a really dry session and it's really difficult if we're if we don't uh, interact together. So uh, I, I'm so this is my first time using this platform and I'm super excited about to see what it can do. Um, so uh, some people, I think, during any sort of type of webinar or really any sort of uh, presentation or conversation, if there's some sort of slide deck, and I have one, people might like to have that up on a, on a second screen. So this is my moment to be kind of uh, like vamping while you like just take the, out your device and scan that or maybe uh, type in the URL there, bit.ly slash I know a student. Um, and once you have that up on your second screen, you'll be able to kind of scroll through. You should know that there's like a lot of slides there. I know we're not going to do all the, the intention was not never to get through all of the slides. It's just that I get to do presentations fairly regularly, and I just wanted you to have the content if you wanted it. You know, we're going to focus on the, the interactive components, which is right here at the beginning. So last chance, I'm going to talk just for one more second while you click that QR code, scan the QR code or type it in. Everyone get it. If you didn't get it, we can always drop it in the chat, or I can, right? I don't know. Mitch, can you? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we can definitely get that URL to you if you don't have it. All right. I'm ready for the next slide. So again, this is my contact information. I was I had the great fortune of getting to write a book. It just came out in May called The New Assistive Tech, Make Learning Awesome for All. And it's really, what I hope you're going to find out today is that assistive technology is not some scary thing that only a handful of people use or know. It's something we all talk about. Uh, all the time with all the different students. So enough of my sales pitch <laughs> for checking out my book. All right, here's the first question. This is, the, like I said, leaning on the interactive component. Uh, first, does anyone know where this picture is from? You don't want to raise their hand and come up on stage and go, Chris, I know. I've seen this picture before, or I think I know where this picture is from. Um, and the next question will be, what do you notice about the picture? But I just want to know, this 
picture is from uh, a website. And I'm just curious if you know which website, if you've seen it before. Anyone have any clues? I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. It says a word. It, the picture says a word, one word. And it's probably a website you use every day. Anyone know what site this might be? Someone Ah, Abigail put in text. I see it. Sorry, Abigail. I missed it down at the bottom of the screen there. She put it in. She says, Google. Exactly. This is a Google Doodle from 2016 uh, on National Teacher Appreciation Day. And I saw this and, uh, and I looked at it first and I thought, wait a second, what is up with this picture, you know? And so I'm going to ask you, what kind of thing, is anyone willing to come up on stage and, and talk with me about what you notice in this picture? And if you feel like texting, that's fine too. But if you want, like I said, interactive conversation. So I'm going to model this, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, so what I notice, I mean, just a couple of things I notice is that obviously one of the pencils is much larger. So I assumed that that was the teacher. Um, the pencils are different colors. And the thing I thought that was really cool is the last pencil is in a, you know, it has the point pointing down. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, is pro you know, like if that person was, if that pencil were in a class, probably need a little bit of differentiated instructions. Oh, there's a couple of raised hands. So I'm going to bring uh, Marjorie up on stage. And, you know, so I Welcome hope I didn't Marjorie. spoil anything. And then no, I'm going to yes, stop my broadcast. Can you hear me? So now? Marjorie... Yes. Okay, great. Um, no, the the last little pencil's having a really hard time keeping up. He's just running. Yeah, his little he, like so. Mitch mentioned that the pencil was. What did you say, Mitch? Was uh, upside down. It was right upside down relative to the other pencils. Right. I, right. I'm trying to use this as not uh, not prejudgmental. You know. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's a great goal. way to think of it. Yeah. <laughs> like maybe all the other pencils are upside down. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I love that. <laughs> is also and they look really content and really like totally together and the little guy at the end looks a little bit uh great a little great bit forlorn and then and, i see and, nicole yeah. also has her hand up so marjorie i'm going to bring you down and i'm going to bring nicole up and let's just see maybe now marjorie i just want to say i totally totally agree with that in that um that last pencil looks noticeably distressed compared to the other other pencils. So, Nicole, what do you know? Nicole? Hiya. So, um, that's exactly what we were like. And he's looking sad. He's smaller than everybody else. He's upside down, um, which is those are the kids I work with. And, um, you know, it's I'm excited to problem solve around that little bugger. Yeah, totally. Thank you, Nicole. That's awesome. That's Thank you. Yeah, and that's exactly what I think most people notice when they take a closer look at it. They see that the pencil is going the opposite direction. It's red, where all the others have a black tip. That one has a red tip. It's missing its eraser, and it is um, noticeably farther away. If you put your finger up next to it, right, you can see that there's a distance between that pencil and all of the other little pencils, you know. Um, and so a couple thought here is that, uh, well, I should tell you, when I first saw this, uh, because I work in special education, I was like, what is this artist trying to say? That where these kids are being left behind and they're upset? I mean, I know happy kids like like this. What what what? And I kind of got like, I don't know, aggravated. And then I thought about it some more and I said, you know, maybe they're really onto something here. You know, like maybe this is exactly how it is. M Mitch, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, you know, I think about the, the school experience and I find that most students like um, you take away, you strip away the social aspects of it. You, you focus strictly on the academics. There's this fear of like, or this attitude towards school, like it's a place you don't want to be, you know, like it's just, uh, yeah, I got to go to school today. Um, you know, if it's a snow day, yay, I don't have to be there, you know, and that's just any typical student. 
Uh, and again, that's stripping away the social element, just thinking of the academics. Now put yourselves in the shoes of a student that has a disability where traditional school is not designed for you. And just think about how much more stressful and, um, and uh, difficult it might be. So Mitch, if you'll move on real quick, let's, let's see if we can analyze this. Oh, I, I got to keep up the chat down there at the bottom so I can see it. Um, everyone, let me ask, what do you see with this, um, this worksheet? What disability might this student have, right? Uh, and just in case I'll describe it to you, you can see this is kind of a standard worksheet where it's got a, a number one and the question is, what is matter? And then the student has kind of uh, tried to write in the answer, what is matter? And then uh, maybe an inch down, it says two, why isn't heat or light matter? And then there's more space, white space, and the student is trying to write. So I'm just curious, what do you, what, uh, like Nicole, you said you work with students with disabilities, but it sounds like you all work with students of varying abilities. What, and I'm guessing you work, you meet with students with disabilities as well. Marjorie's coming back on. Abigail, hopefully you can hear Marjorie. Abigail says, does this student have dysgraphia? Maybe. Let's see what uh, Marjorie has to say. I'm just saying um, definitely a difficulty with fine motor skills. Um, Marjorie said difficulty with fine motor skills. Yeah, okay. So, I would it surprise you? I'm going to get, tell you both dysgraphia, the problem with my fine motor skills, none of that is actually accurate. I mean, uh, meaning, th th I put that the wrong way. It is accurate, right? The student is obviously struggling with handwriting, but it's not a disability. This is my son, who, as far as we know, we don't ha he does not have a disability, but this is his sixth grade handwriting, right? When he was in sixth grade, he's going into eighth grade now took this image when he was in sixth grade. And he wants to be Tony Stark. You know, he wants to be Iron Man. He wants to develop uh, an Iron Man suit and become an engineer, right? So science is his passion. And he knows because he hasn't had any sort of handwriting uh, instruction uh, since he was in first grade, right? And even then it was like formulating letters. Um, no one's taught him handwriting. And so he knows his handwriting isn't good. And I just wonder, like, uh, Abigail, you said you work in sixth grade. Am I, am I thinking of that right? Like how many sixth graders do you know that handwriting looks just like this, right? Uh, uh, actually, I see the smile on your face down in the bottom, right? You must have a lot, a lot right? This is sort of just hand, typical handwriting now because there's not instruction on it. This student doesn't have a disability. And the reason I uh, like to show it in a slide like this is to say that the problem with this activity one is that it's driving the fun out of education for my son, right? I mean, he's not, this doesn't move the needle closer for him wanting to become Tony Stark. He's immediately looking this, knowing that it looks, uh, uh, it doesn't look like, it, it's not clean and organized. It doesn't look like his best work, you know? Um, and so he feels, he gets like a negative feeling around it and that, that translates over to school. But moreover is that this sort of activity would be given to a special ed teacher to accommodate, and in a, a teacher uh, and a student would then have accommodations, but it's really the problem with this is not because a student has a disability. It's in the design of the activity itself, the design of the lesson, which brings me to the next slide. Just in case you thought that was like a one-off, you know, like, yeah, that was just a one-time, like, this is his typical backpack. Would you agree, uh, everybody, that, like, this is just generally, like, what uh, you get a lot of papers? Marjorie's coming back on. Awesome, Marjorie. I had a question there. I mean, I teach yeah. like 11, 12th grade, and a lot of my kids write the same way. Um, yeah. And I, w I wasn't qualifying it as a disability. I was qualifying yeah, totally. it. Totally. They write the same way uh, like really younger, yeah. from third grade up. You, Your audio cut out there, Marjorie, if you had more to say. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. I think the point that I'm trying to make is that those sorts of activities – are not something that need to be accommodated. It's about helping the teacher design more, uh, design a better experience for not just students with disabilities, but for all students. Okay, I'm gonna read this out loud. Uh, Marjorie wrote a text question. Would you disagree with the allowing the kids to type in Word rather than write it? Some of my seniors in high school write the same way. It, no, I would want, here, here's what I, my answer for that Mar Marjorie would be. I want students to express what they know in the modality that works best for them. So if you have a student, so, I wouldn't want to dictate the modality to anybody. I would want it to be their choice. So you want to type it, type it. You want to use, um, uh, and depending on the activity, I'd even uh, I, 
invite some voice comments, you know, why does it have to be text, you know, uh, maybe it does, because you're working on grammar or something like that. But in some situations, it's like, just express to me what you know in the modality that works best for you. And that kind of gets to this concept of universal design for learning. Does that help? It does. Um, so I want to help, if you're working in special education or wherever you're working, it's thinking about how do I design the experience that I can allow for people to express what they know in different modalities, right? So I'm not making everybody do the exact same thing the same way. Cool? Uh, all right, I'm ready to move on, Mitch, if you are. So yeah, move on to the next slide too. Like I said, design instruction with everybody in mind. Just in case you think this is the crazy ramblings of just one guy from Northern Virginia, like who, who has worked with disability for you know 20 years and think he's came up with some sort of solution, I want you to know that it's not just me that is saying this. This is now built into the law. For the first time ever, the universal design for learning, the phrase universal design for learning, which is what we're really talking about there, designing experiences with flexibility in mind um, and thinking about uh, your students with disabilities is written into the Every Student Succeeds Act. And this is still the letter of the law, which says right there, I'm not gonna read it to you, you can see that it says universal design for learning using personalized technology, personalized learning experiences using technology. And uh, if you look at the next slide, that's all about like how to do it. The National Ed Tech Plan has actually been around longer than 2016. It's been there since 2010. It was revised in 2016. But this is the Office of Special Education or the Office of Education just saying, look, universal design, planning for everybody, um, planning with flexibility in mind is, is how, it's, here's how you do it. Right? Some of you may have even heard the, the hashtag future ready. That was born out of you know, this uh, national ed tech plan. So anyway, but these last two slides will let you know there's some uh, teeth behind this. It's not just um, it's not just you know hand people think good good intentioned people. Um, all right, next slide. Let's get to the uh, this question. Um, do any of you know what a quaka is? Anyone know what a quaka is? And if you don't, how might you find out? You put it in the chat or jump on the audio. Abigail says she was go would Google it. All right, Abigail. Nicole says she'd Google it. All right, I'm going to guess everyone would Google it. So if you Google it, what do you get? You have a second screen you can do that on or just open a new tab and jump over and do a Google search for Quaka. I'm curious what you find. And if anyone wants to come on and tell me what they find, that'd be awesome. Ah, there we go. Nicole typed in her answer. The Quaka is the only member of the genus Centox. It's a small macropod about the size of a domestic cat. So do you feel like, um, that's probably a Wikipedia thing, <laughs> Nicole. Um, what does it look like? How would you find an image of what it looks like? Abigail, I can see you smiling down there again. You saw it, right? You must <laughs> you're making a smile. It's so cute, right? It's this cute little fuzzy animal, right? So I think this is kind of a common teaching technique, right? Is that you, if you don't know something, you Google it, right? And if you want an image of something, you do a Google image search for it, right? So I want to imagine now, Mitch, will you move to the next slide? Yeah, maybe a, a, a capybara is what you're thinking of. Yeah. Um, so let's imagine now for a second you had never heard of the word uh, teacher. Or if you were an alien coming from another planet and you didn't know what a teacher was, it was the same thing. Let me go and do a Google image search or just a, a search in general to find out what's a teacher. You know, I'm curious. If you did a Google image search, what do you find? What, are, what comes up? What are your impressions of what you get? What do you see when that when you pull up a Google image search of the word teacher? And on top of that, do you think it represents education in the 21st century and the, the, where we're where we're going? Most images are a female working with young students. Yes, Mitch is coming back on stage. Great. Yeah, Abigail, I noticed that too. What yeah, do you, see, you know Mitch? something. I had never done that before, and I'm shocked. It's like uh, teachers teaching in front of a chalkboard is like two thirds of the thing. It's not even an interactive whiteboard. It's, it's say, certainly Mitch. not sitting down with their students and um, you know and working individually with the students. It's it, you're right. It's it's generally female um, mm -hmm. and standing in front uh, at a chalkboard with chalk. Yeah. Right? You said this term. I'm not sure what it is. Chalkboard? What did you? I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> but well, yeah, when's the last time you see one of those? <laughs> right, 
Right. In my day, when we had to walk five miles to school uphill <laughs> both ways, we had chalkboards. Well, and we called them yeah. blackboards. <laughs> and Abigail wrote, yeah, sometimes with smiles, which doesn't happen. Right. Everyone's smiling and happy. And so my point here is that I think we have two options. Option one is to... Um, is since that, that 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 image there is not really what we do anymore, you know. I think that represents uh, what my father thinks we do, and a kind of an old st style of education where it is someone lecturing to you in front of the in front of the board, and I'm sure that still happens in places. But that has totally moved away. And if you've been doing these EdChat interactives, I'm sure you're talking about all sorts of different inno inno uh, innovative ways to change education. So I think we have two options with the word teacher, right? We can either start to redefine what that means, and I think there's been a lot of efforts in that. In that, like, well, what is school? Is a hashtag on Twitter, and well, what is a teacher, and what do we do? But I think that's a steep hill to up to, to climb. You know, like I said, there's a whole generation out there. Like I said, my parents who have this mentality that education is you crack the skull, you pour the information, you spit it back out in a test, and then you forget it, and then you re rinse, wash, and repeat. You know, and that's what they think teaching is. And so I almost advocate, I, I do advocate, option one is to rebrand teacher uh, or to redefine teacher. Option two is for the next slide, is what if we didn't call ourselves teachers anymore? What if we just ditched that, punted that term? It's, old te it's an old word that we used to use back in the 1980s and 1990s. We don't use the word teacher anymore. Instead, what our job title is, is educational experience designer. I design educational experiences for students, for learners, for, for the people that are coming to my environment that I come in contact with. I'm a designer. And what I design is educational experiences. And when I do that, when I design something, I don't design it for just a small population of people. I design it for the widest breadth of people possible, right? When someone's designing a website or designing a, a, a tool or designing a product, they don't want just some people to use it. They want it to make as wide as range of people could use it as possible because that gives them more, uh, possibly more customers that will buy it, right? And if you're leaving out people, then now you have a smaller customer base. And I think they're the same thing with education is that, and, and don't you think, Nicole, if I, Nicole wrote, she loved this. Don't you think we get paid more? Like, no, I'm not a teacher. I'm an educational experience designer. You go up like three steps on the chart, you know? <laughs> So that's my, my pitch to you, is to rebrand. There's a video there that we're not going to watch today. It's like a three-minute video. That's my son, and he and I made this video together, talking about what it means to be an educational experience designer, what that sh mind shift might be. Um, and, and I encourage you afterwards to just check it out, because this is a short little YouTube video. All right, now on to the rest of the activities for the rest of the, the evening. So um, with that idea in mind, that at least for tonight, you're not thinking of yourself as a a teacher, you're thinking of yourself as an educational experience designer. Here are educational experiences. There are four scenarios that on the next ensuing slides um, that uh, we're going to go through. Now, if you have them up on that second screen, which I hope you do, or have it on another tab, you can use any one of them. You don't have to go in order. Um, but there are four scenarios. And what I'm going to ask you to do is either pair up with one another or I'll, I'll jump in a group with you, or Mitch will jump in a group with you, but we'll, we'll, we'll pair up and get into small groups and talk about these different scenarios and see what kind of solutions we can come up with, okay? Um, sound like a plan? So I think, let me just, uh, let's just go through these four before people okay. pair up. Just be, for, the, for the people who aren't, um, you know, who, who don't have two monitors, you know, and or, or you know, did, don't, don't have it on their cell phone. Um, so scenario number one, uh, I guess is, a well, um, let me, let me talk about let yeah, people read it, right? <laughs> yeah. Just let people read it. I mean, basically this, uh, while you're reading it, I'll just give you the background. This is a student, uh, this is a teacher that makes study guides. Um, but there's in that, uh, you know, it's either a social studies teacher or a science teacher. They make study guides for after their lessons, you know, probably to study for the test. Um, and then they, they have students in there where that study guide is too, the reading level is too high for them. So how, what do we do? How do we help this teacher redesign the experience or how do we help those students that are in that class with that teacher uh, to, to make it better for everybody? What kind of solutions can we come up with? 
So, you know, so and then scenario two is, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, and, and my thought here is that you can pick whichever one of these you want to work on, you know. Uh, but, you know, Mitch, maybe we'll do it this way. Why don't we just do scenario one together? People will, will just stick, we'll all do scenario one. I think that might be easier. So if, okay. if you want to break up into groups, request each other okay. to get in groups. So, so this is the time then, because uh, we didn't rehearse this before, you see the avatars of other people here. And when you click on another person's avatar, you know, something. let me, uh, let me shrink this. Um, when you click on another person's avatar, you end up with a video chat with just that person. And I see a couple of you are doing this now. So uh, we're going to leave the question here and Chris and I are going to come down. And uh, if you're not careful, either Chris or I might click on your avatar and, and, and <laughs> put you on the spot. So I'll bring Chris down first. And I'll bring me down second, and we'll give you about three or four minutes. Okay, and you know you can also you can also enter some of your answers into the uh, text chat. And there were some there were some interesting comments that were texted to me. And when Chris comes back up, okay. So Chris, uh, I, I guess there was a couple things that came through in the text chat before I hand it over to you. Um, or uh, Paul uh, Borkowski texted to me and was saying that one way is to ask the students to design the handout as an activity rather than giving them the handout. And, um, you know, just I happen to be a tremendous fan of student created material. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think? What do you think I of think, that? I think that's an awesome, I think that's an awesome idea. And I think Nicole and um, Becca came up with the same thing. They, they wrote the same thing, have kids be more involved in creating the study guides, you know? Uh, and then Marjorie had a really interesting question, and she, I guess, uh, you know, uh, had some technical difficulties in terms of coming up on stage. So, mm -hmm. um, so her, uh, her statement or her question was, uh, I teach mostly upper level kids, but many of the teachers I mentor face this, this scenario. Uh, can you share your strategies? But you don't have any strategies for this, right? You had no idea. That's why you asked us, so we could do the work, right? <laughs> well, that's exactly it, right? I mean, if I wanted to do a, a lecture, <laughs> I would do a different platform. But the idea was to, to crowdsource it out to everybody here, right? I mean, really, like, Nicole, I think you could spend an entire session just brainstorming this particular problem. And I think one of the... Um, Big uh, switches here is just what um, both Paul said and what Nicole said and maybe others were thinking is like, why is it the teacher is creating this? Um, and for what purpose? Like, like I kind of hinted, like it's probably for an assessment, like the test, but is this the best way to get to the knowledge that the, about social studies or science? You know? um, mm -hmm. I, I'm a big fan of the concept of, of problem-based or project-based learning, PBL, because it makes it so authentic for students to want to learn the content. You know, when there's authentic problem involved, they want to do it. So um, they, they want to help other people generally. You know, most, most, mm -hmm. I, I, that's been my experience. So those are some and the, strategies. So I'd, 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 and I'd like to just ask, uh, who would like to come up on stage? Just click on the raise hand and share some strategies, because that would be great to hear, yes. hear from some of you. Uh, otherwise, I, yep. Oh, good. Here's uh, here's Nicole. So let's see. Um, let's see Nicole. And but like magic, there you are. Hi, Nicole. Oops. Uh, the connection. Oh, there you are. Okay. Hey, here I am. Um. Sorry, my internet was. So I'm an OT, and I'm just going to see great teachers do. Um, you, they are um, using Kahoot. They're gamifying, and, and so it reviewing fun, and um, and then I've seen you know using. Things such as um, snap and read it is it, it costs some money, but it will help um, the re simplify or reading level. The 
can't have it in a digital, digital format. Um, so that may be some schools have it already. And if they don't, there's free sites play, New Zealand, um, or Common Lit. We have um, levels so that the same content's being spoke. Um, I just can pick the level that works for that, the thoughts that I was um, having. And e even just the OT in me likes the movement bit, um, thinking about stations where you could different review question um, tape on the wall in the corners. Um, the kids get and rotate and and walk room, and then it's more of a partner um, event. And that's all. Nicole, I love all of those uh, strategies. I mean, I love the idea that, to, that it make it kinesthetic. Uh, I love the idea of using something like Newzella, which is, uh, you know, it, or New ZLA, New Zella, whichever, I always forget which one they, they call it. But the, the point is, is that it gives the the content in different ways to scale the reading level. So it's still the same content, but the reading level can be scaled. And there are other tools that do that mm -hmm. as well. That uh, It's not necessarily about that one tool. It's about the function of the tool, which is scaling the text. Um, and then you mentioned Snap and Read, which really is primary function is text to speech, right? And so even if that teacher was like, no, it's got to be my study guides and it's got to have my text on it, well, then you could... Uh, I don't know who I was emulating there, but you know, some some curmudgeon that won't change. Um, they could use this tool, and text to speech is free. There are plenty of tools out there that is you, know, you can hit a play button and it'll read the text aloud to you. Uh, news, uh, sorry, uh, Snap and Read is one. Like you said, that costs some money because it has some other features, mm -hmm. but. Um, uh, there's one called Read and Write for Google Chrome. Many students, if they're bringing bring your own technology, they can, uh, you know, there's ways to hit the play button on that. You know, on, on an I iOS device, it's a two finger swipe. You can set it up so you can swipe your finger with two fingers, and it'll play the text out loud to you. So, um, so there's different te tools that you can be made to accommodate this uh, this particular teacher or students that need it. But really, I think where we both we all started um, is let's redesign the activity, right? Let's redesign it. And if you, if for some reason that teacher doesn't want to redesign it, then we would uh, use these tools. Yeah, Abigail, right? We have it in our district too. In our school district, it's on every single, Read and Write for Google Chrome is just available to every student, whether you have a disability or not. All right, let's move on to, this, to, the, to the next uh, scenario and see what we come up with. This is slightly different. So this one is, this student has, um, is a student that you probably know, Abigail, if you're working in sixth grade, I, I, I'm sure you know this student, who he, he likes to read, but uh, what he has trouble is put, getting his thoughts out in a written or text-based manner. He, uh, he, if you pull him to the back of the room, he can tell you everything he, he needs to tell you. He, he knows the content. It's just getting it out in, written, in a written form is a struggle for him, either handwriting or typing. So it's not like, hey, just give him a... Chromebook and he'll be able to type it. Um, I mean, maybe that's part of the solution, but I'm just curious, what kind of things could you come up with, right? And let's do the same thing. Let's, uh, you know, come up with ideas. I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I did put a link that you could go to. It's just a Google Doc that uh, you could type your answers there as well. But however you want to do it, if you want to um, just kind of jot them down together and then we'll talk about them or put them in the, the text chat, that's cool too, um, or put them on the Google Doc, any of that works. So we'll give you another two or three minutes to look at this one. Okay, looks like a couple of you have it. Uh, yeah, just pair up and uh, let's talk about this scenario. And uh, Chris will come back in a couple minutes. Okay, so let me bring Chris up here also. And while Chris is coming up, uh, Marjorie had some really interesting comments. So uh, one was that uh, Marjorie said, you know, you could do oral assessment. And then she further uh, explained that the teachers just just need to set aside the time to meet with the students to to gauge it to engage in the conference conversation to assess their understanding of the material. So in this case, you know, oral assessment could you know could work also, right, Chris? 
Yes. Well, I mean, I think that's uh, such an interesting insight because that's what um, Paul and I, when we paired up in our small group, he said something very similar. And then Nicole put it in the chat. I think uh, I'm thinking oral assessment. Uh, what Paul said. And okay. Yeah, you're back. There we go. Okay. I'm back. So, so, I'm back. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you, the oral assessment doesn't have to be live. It can be um, using this technology to have students get their thoughts out. And then you could still pair it. Now, here's the part that I think is a little bit different than maybe what we talked about is um, what we've had students do is picture a graphic organizer. They put their voice comments or their video comments, uh, links to them in this graphic organizer, and then they still might practice typing it out or writing it out. If for some reason that you need them practicing, one, the motor skills of typing, because that's a skill that students still need to learn, um, or if for some reason you're still working on, you know, language arts, you know, grammar type things, you know, sentence construction, you know, punctuation, all those, you still need those things. So, but you're not relying on that first. They're still getting their thoughts out in, in multiple ways, voice recording, video mm -hmm. recording, or, or some other way. So it sounds like we all came up with the same, same stuff. All right. Uh, yeah, so, so just so here's a, oh, just ahead. an interesting one. I don't know. So uh, Kevin Honeycutt is a is a friend of mine, and you know he when he was a kid he was flunking out of school. You know, one school after another, and finally, you know, it was, it, they were given they were given an assignment, and one teacher walked up to him and said, um, "You know, um, I'd like to see what you can really do. How would you like to?" show what you know about this topic and he said well i'd like to do a diorama and the teacher says fine um i'll give you a week do a diorama and he ended up putting in like 10 times as much time as he would have with the written response and what he did blew the teacher away and actually that one thing changed his whole life and he you know then moved him to become an education because he you know he just got that he wasn't just some stupid kid he could do things that were great Absolutely, because that teacher changed the design of the experience, right? Yep. Uh, yep. That teacher made it a, a accessible to him. Uh, let me let me ask. We've got like less than ten minutes left, uh, and instead of looking at these last two scenarios, I thought we would just kind of open it up to questions, right? If people okay. want to exchange experience with each other, uh, and then I kind of have like a final point to to make. But um, I thought we'd you know if you came with specific questions, uh, we could talk about them together. Because the last two scenarios you, which you're going to find are actually very similar, is that to what we've already talked about? So, so while we're waiting for people to raise their hands, one of the questions that kept on coming up when people were um, were registering is about motivation. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, I th so how would you, how do you design? You know, what is it about designing learning experiences that you can do that will motivate? kids who seem to be unmotivated? Yeah, I, I think there are, I mean, probably lots, but two immediate ideas that come to mind, both of them, which we've already mentioned, is uh, the project-based learning, getting them involved mm -hmm. in an authentic question that, that uh, means something to them, uh, and that results in them creating a product that then they convey, and which actually is the third scenario, not to, not to bring it up, but it's uh, my daughter was involved in a project-based learning where she didn't give a, you know, two, two cares about bees before, but her assistant mm -hmm. principal was a, bee, was a beekeeper, and he went and talked to the, all the second grade class and said, all my bees are dying. What can I do? You know, he got all teary-eyed and weepy in front of a bunch of second graders, and suddenly everyone wanted to help the assistant principal, you know? <laughs> and so now they're wow. all studying insects, and they're all learning about insects because they, they have, they, we need to help him get his bees back, you know? Um, <laughs> And so I think that's a great way to motivate kids because they're not being forced to do it. They're being invited to do it, you know? Um, and then, so that's one. And then two, I think something that we've touched on already in these two scenarios, and when you're designing the experiences for those students that might have trouble with being motivated is you give them options, you know? Um, uh, Paul oh, was saying that he works with students that... Uh, Who's actually up here right now. Oh, okay. Paul, right. did you want to share what your experience was you were saying, you know, with the students you were working with? Uh, yes, I would. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. I was with an organization where our population was troubled youth. 
some of them have been referred to the program by the courts. Others were referred by social workers. In that particular case, the more traditional approaches to motivation may not have been totally effective or even relevant. An approach that we took was path to goal. Now the goal had to be valued by the participant. We talked about goal branching. That is, there is not one terminal goal, but several. And for many, that goal related to becoming gainfully employed in an area to them that mattered, if that makes sense. Yeah. That, you know, Paul, that's, uh, <laughs> that's what's important to, I think, everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, once you're learning, like, well, like, like my son was talking about wanting to be Iron Man, you know, like, that's, eventually he wants to have a job as an engineer, right? So, um, so let me br bring up this kind of final and I'm thought. Bring that, myself, that I'm going to br bring myself down because Abigail wants to come up. Or I had something to. Oh also. yeah, Abigail. So we take one more, one more person. Okay. Thank you, yeah, Mark. Please, I'm out. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome, Abigail. Welcome to the stage. Hi, everyone. So I think motivation is a really big problem in my corporation specifically because we are actually a standards-based grading school. And so we allow our students to take the assessment multiple times to gain a higher score. So there are some kids who are like, well, if I get to take this again, I'll just bomb it the first time and I'll just do it better on the second time. And so we're struggling. This is only our um, beginning years with this. Our elementary schools have done it, but now in the middle school this is now my third year doing it so we're struggling with motivation for sure well abigail let me just ask you real quick there um they get to take the test multiple times but is there alternative forms of assessment meaning yes we just talked about all these different modalities for to get students to express what they know could we use those as, as assessments as opposed to taking a test Absolutely. And I think as a language arts teacher, it's easy for me. I'm able to do a book report. I'm able to do a presentation. We're able to take a, a test. And unfortunately, I think math is struggling a little bit harder with that because how do you, you know, show that you can do order of operations without taking a test? It might be creating your own test. It might be quizzing another student verbally, that type of stuff. And so um, I think just thinking outside the box and for our more veteran teachers, uh, they're struggling with this concept a bit. Yeah, well, you say veteran teachers because that's the way they learned how to do it, right? And so it's, a, I mean, that's my, my speculation. And so it's hard for them to shift out of it. But there, experiences like this show that it's possible and there's, uh, you don't have to go very far. Or it's not really hard to find other people out there, educators that are trying to make that work in the in the math sphere and the language arts sphere and any, any domain that you're working. It's like, let me see what other tools can use to do that. Right, absolutely. It's a shift. It's a shift, you know, because I think people want to just make it uh, blame the students. Well, you know, the motivation, they're not motivated, you know, mm, how right. do we, that's on me. That's on me as the educational experience designer, you know. And I'm also wondering in, in your school, do teachers get much of a chance to work together to try to brainstorm ways or is everybody stuck in their own classroom just doing it on their own? So um, we're actually a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade building. And so sixth grade is kind of a school within a school. We have our PLCs, our professional learning community meetings and that type of stuff. Uh, we broke away from teaming this year. So we had individual pods, like triangles of teaming. Now we're teaming by floor. So we're kind of trying to figure out uh, behavior. We're trying to figure out um, communication. We've had a lot of shifts um, and new hires and that type of stuff. So I would say our best area of collaborating together is in our PLC meetings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Abigail, I have a strategy for you and to, to, to look into. Have you ever heard of pineapple charts? Yes, actually. Yeah. I haven't looked okay. to. I've heard, I just, I need to do more research. I've heard the basic level of it, though. Yeah, I mean, me too. But that sounds like maybe something to be kind of 
interesting for your teachers to just be like, invite other people to come in and see their them them failing forward, you know, them trying yeah. something and seeing if it works. Absolutely. Like, hey, I'm, <laughs> yes, cool. Absolutely. Well, okay, we only have a minute left. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I, okay. What? I, thanks, Abigail. I, the the final thought that I wanted to leave on was the idea that you know, there's a big question in in the world is what is technology? What's the point of it in education? Like. You know, uh, what do we do with all this technology? Because there's administrators who want us to use it and parents who are not sure how to use it. And it's a, just a big question, right? I mean, that's what a lot of these ed chats are about. And you go on Twitter, you see people talking about it. And so I wanted to give you my impression. It's just short little soundbite is the power of technology is in the options it provides. You know, the reason uh, we had to we had to express what we know through handwriting and we got used to that is because we didn't have the options when we were growing up. Right, Mitch? I mean, it was like, right. you write it and you pull them back to the room and those are your two options. And uh, lo and behold, one day cassettes came out and you could record, but no one was doing that because that's too cumbersome to rewind and listen. I'm not going to give kids that option. But now, just like Paul said, there are so many options. You can have kids video record. You can have, just like Nicole wrote, you can have voice recording. You can have them do a graphic organize. You can have all these different ways for them to express what they know and for us to represent what they know, which is the heart of universal design for learning. Yeah, and from, you know, just what, what dawns on me with, with Abigail also is that, you know, you could flip the thing. Right now, we're so used to, we teach and then we test. Well, what happened? What would happen if we said, "Well, look, the kids are, aren't going to try hard on the first test anyhow. Let them take the test and figure out what they don't know, and then let them come back and figure out how to learn it from the very yes. beginning." That's, yes. that's just that's just another way. I love that idea. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, Chris, uh, what what's your topic at FETC? So you I'm know? doing two sessions at FETC. Yeah, I've got two sessions at FETC. One of them mm -hmm. is with Mike Mike Murata, who is kind of uh, famous in the assistive technology inclusion mm -hmm. world. He is. Uh, we're talking about 25 ways to make your uh, your 25 ways to make inclusion practices <laughs> to improve your inclusive practices. That's what it is. 25 ways to improve your inclusive practices. We're going to be mm -hmm. talking about um, the functions of the technology not necessarily the, the types of technology. So what I mean by that is, like when we were talking about, uh, Nicole mentioned Snap and Read, right? Uh, there's lots of mm -hmm. tools that do something similar to Snap and Read, so we're going to talk the function of, of, of that. And we're going to come up with 25 of them. And we're going to make it interactive like this, where it's, again, uh, crowdsourced it out to the group, and then if they miss anything, we'll throw our little two cents in as well. That's number one. Number two is um, escape the room with inclusive strategies. And so... Uh, kind of in the spirit of a breakout, you know, EDU, I, maybe four four years ago now, I went to an escape room with my wife for her birthday. And the whole time, my mind was going like, this is PD, man. This is PD. This is PD. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, we left, left that escape room and we developed, my wife and I together developed a uh, an escape, a digital escape the room where a, wow, while you, you escape, escape. Wow. Total escape That's room at FE. But it's wow, all about learning fun. inclusive practices. Yeah. It's all about experiencing text to speech mm -hmm. and having captions on and all that kind of stuff. So um, it, I've done it many times at other set at other conferences, and it's always a big hit, a lot of fun. So. Uh, well, that sounds that that's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna sign up for that one. Um, and I awesome. and I want to let every let all of you know who are here that um, if you do you know registering for FATC, if you put in the code. EC816, EC for EdChat816, because tonight is 816, uh, you'll get a discount on your registration. So um, I just got an email uh, right before we started from FETC that, they would, that they'd like to offer that. So uh, hopefully that helps you register and come to FETC. Chris, I've really enjoyed listening to you. Uh, even though I have to say that, that Google of teacher Googling teacher of the, uh, the images was really depressing, <laughs> but, uh, no, but I learned a lot, but it was uh, right. It's, it's an, an opportunity to change. And I love your, your, um, you know, your expression of, you know, we're education experience designers. Uh, let's, let's up, let's, uh, let's level up. We're education experience designers. I love, I love that. So I'll, um, I'll see you online. Um, and I'll see you in Florida, uh, in, um, in about four months. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Thanks, thank everybody. Thanks for your participation, okay. everybody. It was great chatting with you all. 
And this is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. I'd like to thank FETC again, and I'd like to thank Shindig for this fantastic platform. And hope to see you all next week. Uh, good night.